Uh oh. Oh, recording. Okay, it's recording. Ah. Great. Awesome. All right, should we go? Should yeah, we do, do it up. Let's do it. All right, here we go. Oh, I have to turn on this other thing. I haven't done this in like three months. On oh, oh, I'm so honored that you. So to I'm telling you, I've been thinking about you this whole time. All right, Aww. here we go. Like she'd make a good guest. She's cute. All right. Welcome to a cup of Java with Dr. Nava. And today <laughs> we're so excited to have Barbara Heller with us today. Barbara is an actor, singer, author, podcaster, and coach. She's been performing and cheering on other artists who she calls Fireflyers on for over 30 years. You may have heard her voice as Boo Irrigation. You know what? I'm going to do that again. No, you uh, did great. Boo Irrington. That's how Eerie you Ten. Like oh, Erie Town yeah. without the W. I love that, Mimi. Oh, this is so cool. Okay. You're I've got to watch all these things now, but let me try that again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Welcome to a cup of Java with Dr. Nava. And today we are so excited to have Barbara Heller with us today. She is an actor, singer, author, podcaster, and coach. She's been performing and cheering on other artists who she calls Fireflyers for over 30 years. You may have heard her voice as Boo Irritin on Disney Junior's Vampirina, as well as the voice of Mei Mei on DreamWorks series Kung Fu Panda, or on the radio or on the web in a variety of commercials, films, and audiobooks. Uh, Hero by Rhonda Byrne, who is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So like maybe don't to name a few. She loves to write songs, musicals, and other fun and inspirational content. She hosts the podcast, See One Beautiful Soul, and leads workshops in finding your creativity, as well as finding your magical voice. You can find out more at www.barbheller.com. So Barbara, we are- That was so a mouthful. Excited. <laughs> yeah, we're so excited that you're here with us. I know that you're in Florida right now, so you're zooming in from Florida here, and we're so excited to have you here with us. And I have been able to witness uh, the incredible musical talent, creative talent. I've been able to come to mindfulness and meditation sessions with Barbara. So I know we've got the real deal here, and I'm so excited to welcome you. Oh, what an amazing intro. Can I have you like in my back pocket wherever we go, especially on dates? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Confidence Thank you. I would be very honored. So Barbara, today, one of the things that you do that I just think is so incredible and so important is your discussion um, of mindfulness and meditation, your deep understanding of it, uh, the way it makes people feel, the way it enhances their psychological and physical health. So just to start us off today, Barbara, if you could tell us, you know, mindfulness and meditation are terms that we throw around a lot. Can you help discriminate between them for us and tell us a little bit more? What do we mean by meditation? What do we mean by mindfulness? How are they related? Beautiful question. And I, I just have to say, I love, I love the way you communicate, Nava, because I wish everyone communicated that way. I feel like you, you and your sister also, for those of you who don't know her yet, she's also equally amazing. Um, <laughs> you both have this incredible way of like walking around the earth. Like in Hebrew, we would say Dan like giving everyone the benefit of the doubt. And it, every question, every way you talk, oh, is that what you meant? Like it's always, and I wish that's what my podcast, See One Beautiful Soul is about. It's like literally you, like how, if everyone could just Nava for a few minutes, that would be awesome. <laughs> yes. um, so I had to say that. So I love the way you asked the question. So I, I've been thinking about this because you've asked me this before, and I think it's a great question. And I guess my very novice answer, and I've only been meditating since I'm 19, I'm 44. So, you know, 25 years, whatever, um, is, or yeah, is basically mindfulness is a way of life. Like it's, it's a thoughtful way of life, like going into the world of beginner's mind, um, and maybe even asking questions of the force, the source, divinity, divine, divine energy, or I, I like to say God, um, although that can be very woo woo and also a trigger for people. So maybe mindfulness, living a mindful life is asking questions and meditation is listening for the answers. Mm, beautiful. I love that distinction there. Thanks. Really, really nice. 
And so we know that mindfulness and meditation, that there are a whole bunch of incredible benefits that you can glean from them. So what are some of those kind of physical and mental health benefits that you can gain from, from mindfulness and meditation? Great. So can I go a little bit into my story? Would that be okay? You can always- Please, please okay. do. Okay, great. So um, to get very personal, because that's what Nava does when you talk to her, she just opens up her arms, even if it's not physical, and she literally hugs you. So I'm, I already feel so hugged. I'm going to just open my mouth and my heart and share. Um, when I was uh, about 30, 31 years old, I went through a very dark period of acute anxiety. Um, and I learned what that that uh, phrase was, and I want anyone who's listening right now who has moments of anxiety to really look that up because there are some, as you know, as a mental health professional, um, there are definitely terms that can really hurt us. And then there are terms that can really help us. And that for me, it was a very game changer, helpful term. Um, I had had a, you know, because I'm an Ashkenazi Jew of Jewish descent and, you know, we, we, we learn that um, historically anxiety is actually what got the Jews out of Egypt, you know, out of communist Russia. Like, who is that? What? It's almost at the door, you know, whatever that is. Like we, we got into hiding that way and it was actually very helpful for us. But there's a point where anything can be too much, right? Without outside of balance. And so I thought that since my mother and my father suffered from severe anxiety often, that it would just be genetic and I would have the same condition. And so I fought really unconsciously or subconsciously for a lot of my life against it. And I would, I have, I've always had a very strict regimen every morning of doing something called morning pages, which is something I, I uh, offer to all of my students that take class with me, um, where you just kind of pour your heart out to the page. Um, I would bike or walk or run every single morning. I still do that. Um, and to keep myself in balance. And sometimes um, starting at the age of 19, uh, with the help of Deepak Chopra and reading all of his books, I learned how to literally sit for 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes in the evening and all through college. That, that, is, that was my drug of choice. Very proud to say that meditation saved me. But at 31, after um, becoming more religious and then kind of trying to ease my way out of it. And that's like, a, I actually wrote a show about it. It was a musical, it was mounted in LA in three places. And then we went on tour and it was like a huge part of my life to write that show. And now I teach other people how to write shows um, and stories and tell their life story to, to kind of get rid of their angst. But um, the point is at 31, after kind of going through this journey of, of going towards religion and becoming very religious and then slowly kind of stepping out and trying to find that middle place between being very secular and then very religious, it, um, it was actually very jarring mentally. Um, I was under the, um, I guess, tutelage of like a few rabbis who, uh, one of whom was actually saying very damaging things to me. And thank God, they're not all like that. I still have incredible relationships with many, many, many rabbis and they're wonderful. And I, I actually wouldn't, I don't know if I'd get through life without them, but this one guy was so he really took his position in, in the, probably the worst way and told me horrible things. And there was a part of me, like everyone else has their baggage and their stuff that wanted to believe these really negative, fearful stuff, things. And I kind of fell into this really dark place and was afraid to make steps to change. And that caused anxiety. It actually caused something called acute anxiety. And I would wake up in the morning and be like wanting to run out of my body or jump out of my skin. If anyone's ever listening, um, I used to actually have a hard time even talking about that because I would think if I say I want to jump out of my skin, does that make me blank, suicidal, manic depressive? I, I, I thought all these horrible things. So I didn't even want to go down the rabbit hole and by resisting it persisted. And it was constant, this like really weird loop. And then I did this thing that you'll you'll understand because you're a therapist, it's called kindling. There was a kindling effect where anytime someone would mention the word suicide or bipolar or depression or anxiety, my entire body would get something called flooded. And the, it was actually a physical experience from the tip of my head to my toes. I mm. actually felt like tingling and scary. And I thought I have to go to a mental, I had all these really weird visions and I really thought I was going crazy. And the reason I share this story is because I want other people to know that there will come a day when you can come out of it. And um, I went to see a psychiatrist and um, I said, she charged a fortune mm. and the whole way there, my whole body was like 
like talk about being anxious. My whole body was vibrating. And I was like, this is a really bad idea. I just knew it in my gut. She's not going to have my answer. And she mentioned Zoloft and all these medications to take. And I've never even tried a drug. So I like, I'm a frozen yogurt and, you know, rent a movie girl. Like I am <laughs> so a cheap date. Uh, you know, I think you and I have that in common. I've just always been that kind of pure kid inside of an adult body. And so I don't know. I just wasn't interested in taking anything. Not that there's anything wrong with taking medication. There is a time and a place for certain people for that. But I just, I had read so much, so much on it and that it, there were so many side effects and it could actually cause the reverse that I actually was physically scared of putting them in my body. And I remember I said to her, is there anything else I can do besides taking these drugs? And she said with this weird little accent, she was actually sick and physically sick, but also something might have been, I don't know. And she said, well, I guess you could like take a mindfulness class or like meditate or like do yoga. And I was like, <laughs> okay, Lily Tomlin from Sesame Street. Like literally that's what she sounded like. And, uh, <laughs> and that's the truth. Like literally, like I thought that was what she, I was almost laughing because here she is on the other side of the room. It was like a scene in a movie. It was literally me meeting Dark Knight of the Soul. If, you know, I write movies, so it's like that moment. And um, I, I was shaking so much that I actually don't think I was sitting on the couch. I kept jumping up. It was so weird. Um, and so I said to her, am I going to be okay? And she goes, well, I guess over time you'll be okay, but you're going to have to figure this out. And I was like, you're right. I am. And I always had since 19, when I started talking to God, I always had a relationship with God. So I was like, God, please help me. And I did, I took a route that probably a lot of people would never do, which is, I think at that time, looking back, maybe I should have taken something because I was so not myself, but I was functional. Like I still showed up for work and I had this strong work ethic. And even though I wasn't sleeping more than four hours a night at that time, I somehow just plowed through it. And my mind was so potent. I, I looked up acute anxiety and I said, what if this wasn't me? What if I didn't identify with this feeling, but what if I could actually see this as a chapter? What if I could something, I think maybe through prayer or listening or meditating, somehow I got this message that it was just going to be for now. Like I was going to go through this really messy phase. And a friend of mine said she was going through a divorce at the time and like attracts like. So I brought her right into my zone and she opened up to me one night and she said, you know, my, my therapist said that when you have anxiety, the reason you have it is because it's sort of like driving through the drive through of a fast food restaurant over and over again. And you throw the French fry container in the back seat over and over and over again. And then one day you slam on the brake and ah, like all the French fries come flying at you. You don't realize how much cholesterol you have in your body or fat or whatever. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, look how much crap I've eaten. So it was that moment. And I said, oh, so it doesn't have to be forever. And she goes, no, it's just for now. Like you're learning something like you're spiritual. Like this is just a growth moment. And that made me feel so much better. And then I started to wonder, do other people who have these, you know, labels like bipolar, depression, whatever it, you name it, you know, anxiety disorder, um, dr drug, druggy, you know, is, is, is it, or could it be just a chapter and not forever? And I'm not here as a therapist. I don't have any, you know, therapy training except for the 20 years of therapy I went through. Um, and my dad's a therapist. So I know a lot of the terms and stuff, but you know, and I coach people. So I know what it means. Like some of these things I get, but I've done so much research on my own just cause I was curious and I wasn't going to take no for an answer that so much of anxiety and depression and these acute moments are actually, in my humble opinion, please don't take this you know, as your thing, is literally the universe like knocking on the door and saying, I wanna talk to you. And how often do we stop in those moments and say, okay, I'm listening. What is it that I need to learn here? Not why am I feeling anxious? Why am I feeling depressed? But what is it that I have to learn here? And if we all could just do that a couple of times, you know, maybe a few days in a row, would something different happen than saying, well, I have this because I have those people and I'm sure you have them in your life too, where they say, well, I would do that. I would take a trip here. I would change my career. I would marry this person or I would date this kind of, but I have, and then you flip, fill in the blank. I have this disorder. I have this, you know, it's almost like a, a death sentence on growth. 
And I was, I just keep seeing it over and over again in my life that when people just put a little space between themselves and that thing, and then they start to do mindful training, they go, oh, maybe this is just a chapter. Maybe this is just a moment in time, even if it lasted 20 years, even if it lasted a year. And so to finish this very long answer, and I'm sorry, I'm going over and over, mm. is I would put my hands on my belly during this really excruciating, anxious time. And I said, God, I would say, you know, outright source, God, divine energy. If this is really a, just a chapter, then show me what it is that I need to learn. And I would literally take my hands and put them on my belly. And it's called somatic breathing. I, I learned that too. And I would breathe deeply into my belly and I'll be darned. Maybe it was just like a few weeks. It started to decrease little by little. And just like a baby learning how to walk, I was able to slowly let go of this serious, really challenging, divine, anxious energy. And then it, it turned into art and I was able to kind of move through it. But that's kind of the place from where I teach. And the only other thing I'll say about meditation when you're in a very challenging state of mind is have a guide, have somebody that can sit with you for part of it and just hold space for you, not take it away, you know, not say I'm going to change you and, and I know the magic potion, but just someone who can be there with you and see if you can find a guided meditation. Cause I wished I had had that at that time. Cause it took a lot longer because when you sit with difficult thoughts, they just expand. And if you can get different thoughts in your head that you can chew on, then you have a, a much greater chance at, you know, letting them go. And so I'm sorry, I just, I had to say that part because the caveat is you don't want to be sitting with, I want to jump out of my skin. I want, cause it'll only get bigger, but, but there are so many resources. You are not alone. If you're listening to this, there are ways to kind of meander. And I am living proof that I do not have those days anymore. I mean, I don't even recognize that girl. So was that too long? of <laughs> No, not at all. And, you know, there are a few things you said that really resonated with me. I think that one of the first things you spoke about was with anxiety, you can't just pretend it's not there, right? You can't just say, okay, you know what? I'm just not going to focus on that anxiety. Tomorrow, I'm not going to have to deal with it. Or the next day, I won't have to deal with it. Because as you said, it can just expand and get bigger and bigger and worse and worse and really, you know, get exacerbated if it's not addressed. And what I love is that, yeah, medications work really well for some people. Um, and the combination of uh, medications and psychotherapy can work beautifully. But in addition or separately, meditation and mindfulness, these alternative ways to work through anxiety, to work through different medical and psychological uh, challenges that people are having. I mean, you see in the research the crazy amount of really positive literature highlighting the medical and psychological benefits. Um, and also, again, the contribution to happiness, to life satisfaction, to, um, you know, to feeling like you're having a very meaningful and fulfilling life. So not only are you reducing anxiety and depression and um, pretty significant mental health issues, but you're also really enhancing um, the positive attri potential attributes of people's lives. Again, happiness, satisfaction, fulfillment, meaning, um, et cetera. So we're seeing really incredible benefits. And I know, Barbara, that you work with uh, adults and you work with children. I've seen you do incredible classes, whether they be improv um, or meditation or yoga with kids. And I know you do them for adults as well. Can you tell us, is there something different that you might do when you're doing a mindfulness or meditation class with children versus adults? Or is it pretty much very similar um, and you're just changing your developmental language a little bit? Yes, um, another great question. Uh, so I exclusively worked with kids from probably age 19 all the way through, I wanna say like maybe 30. Four thirty-five. 35, I didn't really start working with adults until then. I, I had some adult like voice, voice students and voiceover coaching. Um, but then around 34, 35, I was like, you know what? I really want to write a book for women because I keep getting all these women coming up to me and asking me like, 
what's your nighttime routine? And, you know, what do you say to God in the morning? What do you say to God at night? And, you know, how do I meditate? And so I started doing these monthly classes, which you were so cute to come to. Um, and so for the last 10 years, I've been teaching this class. Um, it's, it used to be called Mindful Jewess. And, you know, now it's, there, it, there's a mindful spirit at work. I do all kinds of stuff. And so the only difference really between grownups and kids is that grownups are kids with just more hangups and much more comforts. Like, well, I can't do that because I, I don't feel like myself. Well, what does that mean? You don't feel like yourself. Well, you know, I, I, I need, I need this hang up and I need to talk about this or, you know, I don't share my feelings. Like I have people come to my class, like I'll sit there, but I'm not going to share. I'm like, well, that's part of the experience. And, you know, you, you'll see as soon as you open your mouth, like you did, um, as soon as people start sharing, then everyone starts to feel more comfortable because they're like, yeah. oh, I love that. Um, kids are just so much more resilient and they, they, their affect is that they, they want to bond. Um, and they, they, they want to, you know, be connected at all times, even if they're the shyest kid in the room, they, they want to hear when someone shares, they don't, they don't want to be like, oh, I don't need to hear that. Um, so yeah. And I think, um, now that I'm almost exclusively just this year, such a gift, um, because of COVID, uh, I, I since, um, since August, I've only been working with adults. It's so weird. I haven't had any like kid, uh, lessons or anything. Um, it's just such a joy. It's like, I'm, I'm falling in love with adults again. And, um, you know, seeing that they really need a lot more help than I thought. Um, and I think, uh, the biggest thing that, uh, that I teach is how to turn your issues into paintings and mm. theater and, um, books. And like, I just wrote this children's book over it's for COVID it's called, and then one day the world coughed. Um, and I, I illustrated it. And so now I teach a class in how to write your own children's book and how that can actually save your life. Um, and so people are, are taking the class and um, there's a class that I teach called Find Creative Clarity, which um, is just, it's all about literally like, I throw so many assignments at these adults, um, painting, taking a walk in nature, writing a monologue uh, about your life, writing a screenplay. And they have to do it at all in eight weeks. And somehow by the end, they've fallen in love with like four new art forms. Um, and it's a long list of homework assignments, but everybody's doing it together. And there's this private Facebook group where everybody shares and posts and supports each other. And people are walking away with new careers, new, new side hustles. Um, I had a couple of teachers. Uh, a lot of teachers will take my class because they never make time for themselves. But if it's a structured thing, they'll make time, as you know. Um, and so, you know, I had two teachers that wrote different albums. Like they wanted to finish one song that they wrote by the end and they both wrote their own albums. And that was so exciting to see. Um, and I think, yeah, like the difference is adults can get a lot more accomplished than kids. Um, they can be way more productive. And I think that they get, uh, intellectually, that you can turn your issues and your challenges into art and it can be extremely freeing. Whereas kids get it on a soul level and emotionally they're like, oh, I want to do that. But they don't think, oh, this is going to heal me. So mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest difference. That's so. so interesting. And, you know, one of the defense mechanisms I love the most is sublimation. And I love it because it's so productive. And by sublimation, I mean taking anxiety or tension or things that are challenging and, you know, sublimating them, uh, kind of funneling them into productive creative pursuits so yep. whether it's an off-broadway show about it it's amazing yeah yeah so you know whether it's painting or screenplays or uh the various writing a children's book the various areas you looked at um i think that's huge and for to me i always say that i'm a, the only thing i've ever been addicted to in life is productivity i'm just yeah. addicted to productivity um, and so I always feel the best about myself when I'm being productive. And uh, so you're affording them not only the opportunity to work through some of their anxious challenges, but you're doing it, allowing it in a, in a way where you're allowing them to end up with really productive art at the end. So uh, I think you. that's wonderful. Yeah, I really. think sometimes we just need to have, it, it's okay to say I want accountability and I want to be with other people who can make a big space with their arms wide open. And, uh, and that's what I did. I created a space online. And so now there's a membership group called the Fireflyers Club, where once they graduate from my eight week course, they can join. And it's just a monthly 
small fee and then everyone can be together and they're like, I, I don't want to lose this. And so in the new year, I'm going to probably be doing like a once a week challenge there and showing up for Facebook lives and stuff. And it's, it's such a cool new space to have, you know, everyone connecting online that probably couldn't before. So I think there's, and that's what my book is about. And then one day the world coughed, it's like finding all the blessings. It's actually a children's book for adults to talk yeah. about all the stuff that we're not really talking about. Cause I think the kids will probably be pretty resilient coming out of this pandemic, but it's the adults. Like we had some massive changes in our lives. Yeah. So, um, that's great. Ah, oh, that's so great. Um, now, you know, I know you mentioned some morning routines that you have and some nighttime routines that you have. Would you recommend any specific times of day where people should try to pursue mindfulness or meditation? Yes, I would say, and I, I said this recently in a Facebook live, get up and get up earlier than you did yesterday. Um, when there's, there's a Hebrew fa- phrase called Aira HaShachar, and that's the, one of the names of my classes. It's in Psalm 57. Um, and I'm like obsessed with that. I, I once read that because I've always been a morning person and I used to like, you know, dog myself for it. Cause I'm like, why am I waking up so early? But there was just this high I would get. Um, and so, you know, serotonin is, is most prevalent during that time. And I think I would feel it because as soon as your eyes open, this is scientifically proven. There's like literally serotonin in the brain. If, if you have natural light. Um, so the first thing I would say is get move to a place. If you don't already have one where you can open up a, sh- a shutter and have the sunlight directly hit your eye. If you have no windows in your bedroom, move to a place where you can. Uh, it's extremely important to see the sun, even if it's a small amount of it, get outside. I don't care how cold it is, get outside even for a moment and find a way to breathe in outside air. Um, it's extremely important. Um, and you know, get up early, just get up early. Even if, even if you wake up when it's still dark outside, but you have the opportunity to see the the sun, um, it, it's just, I can't, I mean, vitamin D, it's so interesting. Like if you actually take apart all the things that are happening in this pandemic, it's so godly. It's so d- divine. Um, we're all vitamin D deficient. And why is that? Cause we're, we're doing what we're doing now. It's like, we're sitting in front of a computer um, and it's a necessary thing, but we, one of my rabbis from LA, uh, incredible guy, Rev, um, Yaakov Kamenetsky, um, he, uh, sorry. Oh my God. I can't believe I just said that. Um, <laughs> Rabbi K- Yosef Konevsky. I don't know why, because Yako Kamenetsky is another guy, but anyway, yes, Yosef, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen him in a few years. Um, he wrote in the very first week of COVID, he wrote an article in the Jewish journal and it was profoundly prophetic. And one of the things he said was you wanted more screen time. You got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He said, if you think about all the shears, all the other classes I tried to give during the week, or, you know, how many people weren't coming to synagogue and, and who, whose kids were on the phones, you know, during the time that they probably shouldn't be. Um, it's just so interesting. And, and yet we, we, we were home, you know, and uh, one of my pages in here says, you know, everyone's pay, paying way too much for houses they can't afford. And now they're finally enjoying them, you know, and right. no one's home. No one was home. No one was home. So, um, yeah, I think getting up super early, if you can get outside, see the sun in some way, um, find a space to meditate, even if you have to start 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the evening. Um, and then another thing that I really believe in is taking a walk every day. Um, I don't believe in gyms. I've never belonged to one. And somehow I've always kind of stayed in my zone with like weight. Um, I definitely believe in stretching your body. And then I also believe in fasting in the morning until like as, as late as you can go. You don't really, breakfast is such a terrible word because you, you shouldn't be breaking your fast early in the morning. In my op- humble opinion, um, lots of liquids, you know, water, stay away from non-nutritive sweeteners, have the brown sugar, you know, diet is so important. Um, I think staying away from dairy, if you can, and wheat, um, right now, as much as you can, I mean, definitely eat, but, um, and then at night, um, I think, you know, we have, we're so lucky. We have this incredible canon of 
Jewish liturgy that we can read before we go to sleep. And one of the things I do every single night without fail, and it's the best sleep medicine I've ever had, um, is called the bedtime Shema. And so in that, uh, it's not just like, if any Jews are listening, it's not just Shema, Israel, Asha. it's not that it's, it's, there's a whole paragraph that we say before we say that. And I, I teach it to Jews, non-Jews, Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, everybody eats this up because it's so universal. I didn't write it, but there is a line that says, please forgive anyone that hurt me in any way, whether it was intentional or unintentional in this lifetime or a previous lifetime. And then I always say, and I make my own version of this. Um, cause who has time to open up the book, but, uh, the second statement is please forgive me for hurting anyone intentionally or unintentionally, whether it was in this lifetime or another lifetime. Why? Because we have no idea how crucial that one look was when that person walked in through the door. And I am so guilty that I have such an expressive face. That's what makes me a, probably a good actor. I don't know. Um, I can't not, and you have this too, Navs, because you're so expressive. Um, I, if, if I'm in a bad mood or something has hurt me, I can't escape it. It's like, I get it all out. <laughs> and I won't allow it to fester, but unfortunately everyone around me can feel it. So if, if something just happened with someone else and then another person walks in, they, they could probably think that I'm mad at them when I'm so not. And anyone who knows me knows that I will go out of my way. I'll go to the ends of the earth. I'll walk 20 extra blocks just to tell someone if they, if they upset me, cause I want to work it out. So I'm not carrying it around with me. That's like mm -hmm. one thing all my friends know if they're, if anything's going on, they're like, Oh, I have to call her. Now we have to really hash it out. Oh, but they love that about me. And they also hate it. Cause I, I, I will go right up to what's bothering me. So sometimes if someone else is super shy and they see you roll your eyes and they don't know how to deal with it, they could be carrying that eye roll that you did for years. I have, I have a friend who just opened up to me this year after like six years of carrying around this thing that I said that, that hurt her so much. And it was so beautiful when she finally, and of course I was not defensive at all. I was like, Oh my gosh, I wish you had told me like, what hurts me the most is that you've been carrying this for, she's like, well, that was on me. I said, no, but still like, I love you and I don't want you to be. So that is all to say, like, you know, I have some friends that are like, well, my parents did this to me and da, 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 and this person and this boyfriend, and I have nothing to feel sorry about. Cause I never did anything to anyone. I'm like, well, interesting. You should say that. Cause you don't know how you come across everyone. Do you like, if we knew how much we hurt people, we would not be able to wake up the next day. <laughs> you know? And at the same time, you know, if we knew how much people really loved us, really truly loved us and why it makes me cry, like wanted to give to us like completely wholeheartedly, we also might not be able to wake up because the, the monstrosity of how much love is really in the world for us that we're not receiving We'd feel so guilty. Oh, I, I ran away from that big gift because I was just afraid of intimacy. Like this happens daily because we're human and we, we just can't receive it all at once. So I love that prayer at night because it's the great equalizer. Oh, I love that. And we know how hard it is to apologize, to forgive. All of these things are really hard to do. And so if every night you could be saying, you know, sorry to those who you might have hurt and also, you know, uh, you know, uh, accepting forgiveness in some ways. What a beautiful way to go into sleep every night and wake up refreshed and, and enjoying the sun and the outside as you um, so astutely are recommending. So, so sweet. Um, I also, love that. Thank you. I just want to add one more thing, which goes yeah. even deeper that what makes it the great equalizer is that it's really not about us. You know, that phrase, let go, let God, what is it that keeps us up at night? What makes us toss and turn? It's really not the caffeine because right. if you're really exhausted. You go to sleep anyway. It's, and I'm not trying to minimize food allergies and, but it's really something deeper, right? It's literally letting go of all that stuff. It, if you actually analyze all the things that make us toss and turn, it's, I hurt somebody and I can't sleep or someone hurt me. Yeah. How, how are they waking up at night or going to sleep at night and waking up in the morning? How, how, that's not fair. Well, instead of spending all that energy 
worrying about what could have been, what should have been, why don't you just literally raise it up and say, it's your call. And when you say, I'm letting go of this, please forgive that person. You're actually acknowledging that that great equalizer is going to give that person karma. And you're hoping, cause you're such a kind heart that it's actually less than what they deserve, quote unquote. Yeah. It's so yeah. deep, right? And then when you say, and then please forgive me, you're acknowledging that you could have also hurt somebody. Right, I love that. It's so important. I had a girl take my class. I tell this story sometimes because it's it's so moving to me and I'm so grateful that I had I was privy to it. So let's say her name is Bethany. She took my class and you know Bethany grew up in uh, the inner city. She was um, abused as a child. She was mm-hmm. slapped around and she was adopted. And she came to me and said, I have been on tranquilizers to help me go to sleep because I have demons. And I'm like, absolutely. And again, acute demons, not, she wasn't born with it. It's not a chemical. This is literally, she grew up and has terrifying images in her brain. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and she said, I really want to convert to Judaism. And I want you to show me, I want you to hold my hand and take me through the, the prayer book and show me what are your tools? Like, how do you wake up in the morning? Is there anything that can help me go to sleep? I'm like, it's funny. You should mention that. I have this thing that I do. And I'm so grateful that God put her on my path because I shared this with her and she got off the tranquilizers the first week. Then she got off her antidepressants. Then she got off her anti-anxieties. And now she only does this prayer. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. I wish I could take credit for it because that would be so cool. <laughs> it's so not, it's so not me. And I, I don't want it to be about me, but I'm so grateful. I got to be the, in the front row of that experience because she is sleeping because yeah. of sentences. You know what I mean? Right. Just acknowledging that God will take care of all of it. She doesn't have to be in control. So mm-hmm. I'm sorry I went off on that tangent, but I just, it had to be said. And I, I love how you also said earlier that it's not only saying the prayer, which is incredibly um, special and meaningful and helpful, um, but it's also addressing things head on, not letting them fester. When, when there is a altercation between two people, going right to that person in a sensitive way, uh, sharing with them what's upsetting you, to give them that opportunity to apologize, to give them that awareness that this even happened. So I think that combination of what you said of addressing things head on in a sensitive and private fashion, uh, coupled with these prayers at night and this kind of meditative uh, stance, um, I think that combination is ideal. Me too. So I really like that. Um, Okay, so um, I don't want to take all your time. I could go on and on with you, Barbara. I love, love hearing from you. Um, before we end, um, just two or three more things. Um, I know everyone listening is probably dying to hear a sample mindfulness or meditative trick or, um, practice or routine. Uh, can you share one or two of the, you know, routines that you might do, uh, to in the morning or at night that you find is particularly impactful that people could try you know, again, in their morning or nighttime routine? Sure. So um, absolutely. So it involves these note cards. Um, So I will have my morning process where I wake up first thing in the morning and I jump out of bed like a lion because that's like what we're commanded to do. And I say, I'm so grateful that you returned my soul back to my body because we know a little piece of our soul goes up you know, to the heavens at night. And then when we, when we return in the morning, we we've got it all there, uh, God willing. And so I jump out of bed and I literally jump out of bed every day. I'm also a Leo. I've got the hair. So I'll just (laughs) jump. Um, and that's really helpful. Um, and then what I do with the cards is not every day, but if there's something like a lump in my throat, like really bothering me, I call up to the surface. Okay. What is this? Not why, why is the worst question to ask? when we're feeling down, what can I learn from this? What is it that I'm really struggling with? And I usually have a statement that will say, like I used to struggle with, I'm just not lucky. Like all these people around me are so lucky. They found their soulmate. They have children. They're living in this house that I, like I've had a very similar vision board for many years that has all these things on it. 
And I've had an incredible life. I am so grateful. I've had such incredible things happen to me that you wouldn't believe. I met Josh Groban in the grocery store at 10 PM at night, just me and him. And we hung out yeah. like that doesn't happen to everybody. And I am so grateful for that. I, I actually have a, you can look it up on Facebook. I made a little video about it. Um, it's just me vlogging about it, but like there's no way I'm lying because it's so real and it really happened. I mean, I it's amazing don't lie about it, but that really happened to me. You know, like I've had such incredible moments of meeting people that I've always wanted to meet and working with them and meeting celebrities. And um, I feel very, very, very lucky in so many ways that I mean, I, I survived COVID. I got on a plane in the middle of the night in March from New York City to LA. I already flown across the country twice. I went to Mexico recently and I'm praying the whole time. Like, oh my God, I am so grateful. And, you know, there's things that I don't have yet that I've like always wanted to have. Um, and I, I sometimes struggle with this, this negativity that comes up and it'll say, well, I'm not lucky or, you know, this person's lucky and I'm not. And it's so annoying when it comes up, but it's something that I struggle with. And so if that's happening on a morning or if it happened in the past, cause it's not happening anymore, um, I will write down, you know, I am feeling unlucky. And so then I do Byron Katie's for turnaround questions and stuff. I change them up a little bit. So I ask myself, is this true? And I'll be like, yes. And then the second question is, how do you know it's true? I'm like, well, I mean, I guess I am pretty lucky because X, Y, and Z, you know? And then the third question would be, well, you know, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> That's how I change it. And I say, well, I guess I could just sit here for a second and name 10 things I'm grateful for. And then all of a sudden I start feeling lucky. And then I'm like, huh, I guess I am really lucky. And the fourth one is the turnaround. It's like, well, I am really lucky. And now I know that I am a lucky person because X, Y, and Z. And so that's what goes on the card. And then it becomes a mantra. And so sometimes I turn my mantras into art. And so like this painting behind me, um, which you can't see right now if you're listening, but there's a beautiful painting that has a sun in it and some flowers. And I have become the most amazing painter because um, I have paintings all around my house from doing mantra art. It's art that I created out of darkness and it's awesome. And people will always say, God, that's so pretty. What is that? And then I get to tell them, well, oh, well that day I was feeling really crappy. And then this is what I wound up doing. And, you know, and now I know that the light cut and they're like, wow, now I like it even more, you know, and it's never arbitrary. I think great art is never arbitrary. I think it comes out of, you know, feelings and stories and, you know, chapters. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah. So you, you mentioned the note cards that you take out. Um, and you you jot something down and then you start to really kind of question that statement. Um, and then you sublimate that those that those tensions, those challenges into the beautiful art. And I love that. What a great uh, a great trick to do. Um, I love that. And then and then at night, is there something that you do at night? Um, well, I definitely say the bedtime Shema. Um, right. I give myself, probably like an hour of the, the lights be, I learned this from the people that I always tell you, you remind me of, well, the person, Marion Blinkoff, who's my soul sister for life. And, um, I, I put you in that same character category. I think we'll always be soul sisters for life. Mm -hmm. Since I met you, I'm like, and also just because out of the sheer, like similarity that you have with my best friend, Marion, like you just, you are so similar to her. Um, and she's such a special human being. I mean, she's an, like an angel. Um, and so are you, um, but you know, she and her husband have like these routines that I kind of picked up. Cause I, I mean, basically lived with them near them for so many years. And one of the things they taught me with their four children and her is like, you have to have routines at night. And so they have certain yeah. music for nighttime and they, they turn the lights down low. And so when I moved to New York and, and even like in my whole adult life, I've always had these cool lamps. And I'll go out and seek them. And as long as they have a dimmer switch, they go in my bedroom. Mm. And I do that because there's a kid inside of all of us. And so just like you put your, you know, little Judas and Jonas to sleep. So I, I have to put myself to sleep too. And so I make sure the screen time goes off at a certain time. Mm. Um, and every night it's a little different because of, you know, whatever. And if I do watch something, it has to be something very soothing. I can't watch horror movies or porn or anything like R-rated. I just can't. I, my body's like, nope. So like, 
I just can't. So it has to be very lighthearted. Um, I try to read, you know, inspiring things. I do also keep a notebook by my bed um, that I can fill up with creativity yeah. um, because in the middle of the night, especially once you start taking my class, uh, you will start to have incredible creative ideas and it can really keep you up at night if you can't just jot them down. Cause you then you'll be like, how is am I going to remember this? And then you get, you know, so um, every artist, which is really everyone should have a, a journal by their bed. Yeah. Um, and I do different lotions at night for my feet. That helps too. That's great. I also have a creativity notebook next to my bed. So I'm excited that we do the yep. same thing. That's really, really great. Um, okay. So um, two last things. Okay. Um, I know that after hearing all of these amazing things, people want to know how to find you. So can okay. you tell us uh, how to find you? And then you mentioned running into different celebrities. Okay. Are a celebrity and have this unbelievable ability to do impressions of celebrities. So, um, so in whichever order, I'd love to hear an impression or two, if you have them, sure. um, and then how we can reach out to you. If people want to learn more about your wonderful classes, your book, sure. and all the incredible things you do. Okay. So thank you for asking. So the first, uh, just to answer your question. So you can always find me at barbheller.com. I have two new classes coming out at the beginning of this year. Um, so look out for that. You can find me on Facebook. You can email me at info at barbheller.com. You can find um, all of my classes at barbheller.com, but um, they're changing the name. So I have a voiceover class that I teach online. Um, I also have, uh, I teach private lessons for voiceover, for creative coaching and also singing. Um, that's just like technical stuff. Um, but then I also have this class called Find Creative Clarity, which the name may be changing a little bit because it kind of throws people off. Um, I have a class coming out soon called Speak Your Magic, which will mm -hmm. allow people to speak better um, online in front of the camera, like getting more comfortable with just expressing themselves. Um, if you're a TED talker or you're a wannabe TED talker, um, if you have a really hard time putting together a commercial for your business, I can help you with all of that. And in eight weeks, you will have a keynote that you can just put in your back pocket and take out at a wedding, wherever you need to give a speech. Um, so yeah, so if you're interested in that or writing your own one person show, all of that can be done in, in my class. Um, and I also have this thing called the Fire Flyers Club, which is on Facebook, it's a group and it's specifically for people who have taken one of my classes before they can jump in and you know get cool assignments and have like like-minded people. Um, and yeah, find creative clarity is an awesome class. I just, I may be changing the name of it. And then the, there's also my, my, uh, podcast called see one beautiful soul. If you think you have a great forgiveness story, it's all about forgiveness and tools of freedom. Um, you can definitely inquire to be a guest on the show. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much how you get in touch with me. That sounds amazing. Um, and I know that I've listened to so many of your different impressions. I oh, think right. one Favorites is Sandra Bullock, just because uh, she's one of my favorites. <laughs> and, uh, you might be able to do a Reese Witherspoon or something of the sort, but okay. I don't put you on the spot. So that's okay. All right. So give me um, a situation, like maybe they're trying to return their Christmas gifts or something. Oh yeah. Okay. So they're at a store. <laughs> they're trying to return gifts that they uh, just received. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah. And okay. And you're on. So I'll do. Sandra Bullock trying to return her gifts with her kids. Okay, here we go. Uh, sir, yeah, someone got this uh, Fisher Price thing for my kid, and I, I just, oh man, uh, sit down. Oh, stupid, stupid. Okay, that's my Sandra. Bullock. I love it. Okay, and then Reese Witherspoon would be like, um, uh, so, <laughs> oh my God. Okay, I'm having Reese block. Hold on. I haven't done this one. Let me see if I can do it. Are you sure? No, I'm no, I really don't. Okay. Well, did you did you brush your teeth? Because we're not going to Target until you do that. Okay. I don't know. That was a little more I love it. I love it. I could do Kate McKinnon. Kate McKinnon is actually my favorite person to do. And I met her once. In, well, I didn't meet her, but I was behind her in Starbucks. And then I wrote to her on Twitter and she posted what I wrote, which was like, so cool. Um, oh my God. The head of her fan club did it, but she liked, I don't know. It was like a whole thing. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I know it was her. So 
Kate McKinnon is just so fun to do because she kind of has this really weird, like Jane Lynch slowed down type of tone. And she also fits in the Candace Bergen area. So we've got like Candace Bergen, Kate McKinnon, Jane Lynch, and um, Helen Hunt is somewhere in there too. You know what I mean? She's just a little more uh, like a uh, breathy, but they're all, they're all there. You know what I mean? They're just all in that really. And my favorite person that I used to love to imitate before Kate McKinnon was Anne Curry the Ooh. news anchor because she would report the news and you just felt so much just by listening to her and then a guy named Matt Lauer just ruined just ruined her career and it was it was devastating and then you know look at what happened to him so I don't know that's uh that's the news there we go all right you've done it all <laughs> what, a, what a way to come out I love it I love it oh those were amazing uh, well, Barbara, we are so thankful to you for joining us today and giving us so much wisdom, not just about meditation and mindfulness, but just how to live a really balanced, tranquil life. One, not only that is balanced and tranquil, but one where you can feel productive, you can turn challenging things into art, into beauty, um, and into feeling really wonderfully about yourselves and about the world around you. So I really can't thank you enough for joining us today. And uh, we really look forward to uh, hearing from you again soon. Thank you, Nava. It's been a pleasure. You're so good at this. You're so good at listening and making space for people. And we're lucky to have you too. Thank you so much. Yay. All right, I'll see you.